if you join me in Acts chapter 15, uh, our celebration, our the word of encouragement that the Lord has given to us, relates to our mission. And that mission is defined, clarified perhaps, in Acts chapter 15. So Father, we come before you again. We, we thank you. Holy Spirit, you are our teacher. You guide us into all truth. We ask that you would fill us, come upon us with the power from on high to give us the gift of teaching, to understand what it is you're saying to us this morning. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so we are in Acts chapter 15. Last time in our study, we were in Acts chapter 14. Uh, Paul and Barnabas had moved from the the uh, the fruitfulness, but also the hostility uh, to the gospel in Iconium to preach the gospel in Lystra. And there, uh, Paul healed, the Holy Spirit through Paul, healed a man born lame. And that created a ruckus. Uh, the townspeople thought they were Zeus and Mercury. Uh, the priest was about to perform a, a sacrifice to, to worship Paul and Barnabas, and they were barely able to stop them. And then after that, uh, unbelieving Jews from Antioch and Iconium came to Lystra. They turned the entire town against them. They stoned Paul and left him for dead. But Paul, who is a man of God, in the will of God, doing the work of God, is not finished with his course. And so he rose up, and Paul and Barnabas continued God's work in Derby, And they were there a while. They, they taught the gospel. They, they, they preached the gospel, and they taught disciples. And then they retraced their steps all the way back home to Antioch. At each of the churches that they planted, they said in Acts chapter 14, verse 22, they spent some time in each of those churches confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith, and that we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. And that was true then, and it is true now. But now, in in the study of the ministry of the Holy Spirit, we continue in Acts chapter 15, when a false gospel from Jerusalem comes to Antioch, and it creates an uproar. We know that there has been a, a simmering church split brought on by the conversion of the Gentiles, but now it comes to a boil. And we need to consider what, what that means because from its birth and in its early days, the early years, the church was Jewish. But obviously God was also working among the Gentiles. And what's coming to a boil in the church is, wait a minute, Jesus said salvation is of the Jews. So what does that mean? What does salvation mean? And of the Jews, what, what does all that mean? How can a person be saved? And it's either by the gospel of grace or by the gospel of works. And that's the issue that has come to a boil in chapter 15. And as a result, the first church council is convened in order to settle this. It has to be settled. So we begin Acts chapter 15 and verse 1. And certain men which were come down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain of them should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about this question. So here we are, we're in Antioch uh, at the end of chapter 14. Uh, Paul and Barnabas are ministering there. They're, they're being refreshed there by the fellowship. They're awaiting instructions from the Lord for what it is he wants to do next. And into the church in Antioch comes from the church in Jerusalem some Pharisees. And we know that as we go through the chapter, that these are Pharisees. Now, uh, they did not outright deny that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. But they did teach 
that in order to be saved, you Gentile believers must also be circumcised in keeping with the law. Or put another way, that the work of man must be added to the work of Jesus Christ. Now, this teaching, as we read, uh, very much upset the believers there in Antioch and offended, I would say offended, Paul and Barnabas, and it resulted in a heated dispute, an absolute uproar, because what was being taught was another gospel. You might say it was Jesus plus. You might say it was salvation by works. Uh, but it's created an uproar. And why? Why did Paul and Barnabas so intensely dispute this, the teaching of these brothers from Jerusalem? Well, because they know the truth. And because they know the truth, they know the lie when they hear it. And these are men with shepherd's hearts, hearts after God's own heart. Jesus is the good shepherd. They have a, the heart of Jesus, the, the spirit of Jesus, and they love the flock of God. And they will protect them from danger. And the danger is wolves in sheep's clothing, just as Jesus prophesied on the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 7, verse 15. And Toward that end, if we bear in mind, you might want to go back there to Galatians chapter 1, the, the reason for our corporate reading being there, uh, why Paul was so upset about the teaching of these false brethren. You see, Paul is an apostle chosen by Jesus, chosen by the Father. He was not chosen or appointed by man. He has a divine calling on his life. And he says there in, in verse 4 that whosoever will believe in Jesus Christ is delivered from this present evil world. Jesus who gave himself for our sins delivers those who believe in him from this present evil world. So you see, it was evil then. <laughs> it's evil now. Nothing's changed. Uh, Paul was offended because perverting the gospel of Christ troubles the disciples of Jesus. It, it upsets the flock. And every other gospel other than the one that he received is cursed as well as those who preach it. Uh, the, the one, the gospel that he preaches came directly from Jesus Christ himself. And the gospel is of grace. It's not of works. And if you're in Galatians chapter one, look at verse 18. It says, and then three years, then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter. You see, upon his conversion, the apostle Paul spent three years at the feet of Jesus as the way, the life and the truth poured his heart into him, just as he had the other 11 apostles for three years. And this teaching from the Pharisees in Jerusalem uh, has resulted in an uprising. And so the church in Antioch, so we, we have to figure this out. We have to know what is true. And so they sent Paul and Barnabas, and it says others, to go to the church in Jerusalem in order to get this most important issue resolved. What's the issue? How is a person saved? What is God's gospel message to the church and to the world? Before the church goes any further into the world, this has to be resolved. So back to Acts chapter 15, verse 3. And being brought on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenice or Phoenicia and Samaria declaring the conversation, the, excuse me, the conversion of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy unto all the brethren. And when they were come to Jerusalem, they were received of the church and of the apostles and elders, and they declared all things that God had done with them. Uh, you know, we, we get a sense for Paul's personality in his letters, and I would imagine that he's all fired up. Uh, he's eager for battle here in Jerusalem, and 
they leave Antioch. He and Barnabas and certain others with them, they leave Antioch. They they make this 400-mile journey, so it's going to probably take them 20 days. And as they go, they're declaring what God had done among the Gentiles, which was to turn them from idols to serve him. And everywhere that news was delivered, uh, the brethren rejoiced, and, and rightly so, about what God had done. But obviously, they, they got to Jerusalem. They were warmly welcomed uh, by the church. And I should have told you to keep a finger in Galatians. I apologize. You might want to put something in Galatians. We're going to go back maybe another couple of times. But in Galatians chapter 2, verse 9, Scripture says, And when James... Cephas, of course, that being Peter, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me. They gave to me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship and that we should go unto the heathen and they of the circumcision. The, this first part of, about, of chapter two of Galatians is about what we're going to read in Acts chapter 15, the first church council. So they were received warmly when they got there. Paul and Barnabas were. Uh, and as we go back to Acts chapter 15, then what we read is as they did in Antioch upon their return from the first missionary journey, as they did in the churches on their journey from Antioch to Jerusalem, they now do in the church at Jerusalem. And that is declaring what God has done among the Gentiles. Now, going back to Galatians again, uh, just a, a note of interest, perhaps, you know, a time stamp. Uh, we read in chapter 1, verse 18, uh, after three years, which means in verse 17, when Paul went to Arabia and he was taught by Jesus, he, he was taught for three years. After three years, then he went to Jerusalem. Now, if we slide down to chapter 2, verse 1, then 14 years after, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also. And I went up by revelation and communicated to them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to them which were of reputation, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. But neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised, and that because of false brethren, unawares brought in, who came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us unto bondage. Uh, this is a description of, of, of what happened when Pharisees from the church in Jerusalem went to Antioch and told the believers there, you have to get circumcised and you have to keep the law in order to be saved. Uh, it happened 14 years after spending three years with Jesus after being converted. So roughly 17 years after Acts chapter 9, we have the Apostle Paul returning to Jerusalem to do battle about the gospel. And we also notice that in Galatians chapter 2, one of those others that went with him was this man named Titus. Uh, now, going back to Acts chapter 15, verse 5, well, at the end of verse 4 says, declaring all things that God had done with them, but <laughs> there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees, which believed, saying that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. So there they told the church in Jerusalem what God had done among the Gentiles, but that gospel was objected to by Pharisees in the church, and they're described as which believed. They're believers. These these believers, excuse me, these Pharisees are believers in Jesus Christ, but obviously, by what they believe, uh, they're still carrying around some religious baggage. They haven't been able to let go of the legalism that so deeply ingrained after so many years of training. Uh, and in this church council, uh, they're arguing that it is necessary necessary for Gentile believers to be as they, meaning to be circumcised and to keep the law of Moses. Now, 
screech. <laughs> you know, it's been 17 plus years, granted, but they have either forgotten or they don't yet understand some of the harsh words that Jesus said to them uh, about their sect. And that's recorded for us in Matthew chapter 23. So let's look at a portion of that this morning. Matthew chapter 23. And in this chapter, uh, many times we read, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Uh, in verses 23 and 24, one of those is, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe the mint and anise and cumin and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought ye to have done and not to leave the other undone. Ye blind guides which drain at a gnat and swallow a camel. Uh, they missed, Jesus told them during his ministry that they missed the entire point of the law. The He told them... At one other point before that, that the the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like the first, to love your neighbor as yourself. And upon those two things hang all the law and all the prophets. That's love. That's the point of the law. They missed it. Uh, they're... The Pharisees here in the church at Jerusalem that believe, uh, they're still missing it. And also in the flow of things... They're also objecting to the gospel of grace. Even after the pastor of their church, <laughs> inspired by the Holy Spirit, wrote a letter to the entire church uh, in which he said in part, and if we go to the epistle of James, James chapter 2. James chapter 2, starting verse 8. And, and this letter was written to the entire church, and, and undoubtedly he preached it in Jerusalem, and they would have heard him preach this. Verse 8, If ye fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. But if ye have respect to persons, oh, you can't be saved in, unless you're circumcised. But if ye have respect to persons, ye commit sin and are convinced or convicted of the law as transgressors. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. To stand before God acceptable to him means perfect obedience to the entire law every day, all day. Any, any sin makes guilty of all. Uh, so this is really their objection their argument back in Acts chapter 15, verse 5, uh, some of the things that said was said to them by Jesus, some of the things, no doubt, said to them by James, not sinking in. Uh, and as a result, the gospel of grace, which Galatians chapter 1, Paul refers to it as the gospel of Christ. The gospel of grace is under attack in the early church, even by believers. Even believers in the church are attacking the gospel of grace. Acts 15, verse 6. And the apostles and elders came together for to consider of such, con consider of this matter. And when there had been much disputing, let's just stop there for a moment. Uh, Paul and Barnabas came, shared what the Lord had done among the Gentiles, uh, shared their message. It created an uproar. Uh, the Pharisees, I believe, objected to it. So a church council was convened to discuss the matter. And the matter is the very nature of the gospel. How is a person saved from condemnation and eternal death? And in the church council was intense discussion. Both sides questioning each other very hard. And there's no agreement. And so as I think about that, I'm, I was thinking, okay, well then upon what authority... Will this church council stand in order to settle this debate? And of course, we'll find out as we go on. Verse 7 continues. And when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, ye know how that a good while ago God made choice among us, 
that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us, and put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. So, uh, remember, we're in the church. The church is a family. Uh, When Jesus was ministering, at one point, someone came to him and said, you know, your your mother and, and your brothers and sisters out there, they want to talk to you. And, and Jesus said, well, who, who's my mother and who's my brother? Those who do the will of God. They are my mother and they are my brother. And so the church is a family. In this family discussion, and we've all had family discussions, maybe we know what it's like, but in this family discussion, Peter's given the floor. And remember who Peter is. He was the early spokesman for the church. Uh, before Jesus went to the cross, he said, I will never deny you. Well, he was humbled. Uh, and he was also empowered to strengthen his brethren, as, as Jesus said he would. And he has been moved by the Holy Spirit. And he's moved again by the Holy Spirit here, as will be uh, born evidence of by what he says. Uh, and he says, first of all, men and brethren. We're all brothers in the Lord here, is what he's saying. Uh, a good, you know, because he's rehearsed this with them. You know how a good while ago, you know this this issue about the gospel, about God working among the Gentiles. It didn't, didn't just come up today, and it didn't come up yesterday, uh, but a while ago, and it's been simmering ever since. A good while ago, God made choice among us, meaning. The work among the Gentiles was the sovereign choice of God. It was not Peter's choice. It was not the church's, the church at Jerusalem's choice. It was God's choice. Uh, And what, how did he do it? Let's go back to Acts chapter 10. Keep a finger in 15, of course. We're going to bounce right back. But in Acts chapter 10, remember that uh, Peter is in Joppa and he's in the house of Simon the Tanner and he sees a vision. And he sees a sheet with all sorts of different animals on it. And the Lord says, Peter, rise up and eat. And Peter says, no, not so, Lord. Uh, I've never eaten anything common or unclean. I have kept the dietary law. But then the voice from heaven said to him, what God has cleansed, call not thou common. And of course, that happened three times. And in the course of that time, the people we know sent from the house of Cornelius were knocking on the door because they found out that's where he is. And when there's a knock on the door uh, asking for Peter in, in chapter 10, verse 19, while Peter thought on the vision, the spirit said unto him, behold, three men seek thee. Arise, therefore, and get thee down and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. This was all the work of God. This was not Peter's work. This was not even the church's work. This was the work of God. Now, keep your finger in chapter 10. Let's go back to chapter 15. We're in verse 7. How God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. Uh, Going back to Acts chapter 10, when, when Peter gets to Cornelius' house. Uh, In verse 34, Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation, he that feareth him and worketh righteousness, and what is righteousness? It's the righteousness of Abraham, to believe. And worketh righteousness, he is accepted with him. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is the Lord of all. And then he gave them the gospel, who Jesus is, what he did. And slide down to verse 43. And to him give all the prophets witness, that through his name, whosoever believeth on him shall receive remission of sins, shall be forgiven, shall be reconciled, shall be made know, made new. And the, and the, the the Gentiles present in Cornelius' house heard it, they believed it, and the genuineness of the faith in their heart was witnessed of by 
God himself when he sent the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 11, and the word of this gets back to Jerusalem, the church in Jerusalem. And Peter goes back to tell them what happened. And in verse 15, he says, And as I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them as on us at the beginning. Then remembered I the word of the Lord, how that he had said, John indeed baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. For as much then as God gave them the like gift as he did unto us who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, what was I that I should withstand God? And when they, be the church of Jerusalem, again assembled at the first church council, and when they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, Then has God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. Uh, Peter is going through this again. Uh, he says in chapter 15, verse 9, that God put no difference, no distinction, no separation, no discrimination between us and them, between us, the Jews who are circumcised, and them, the Gentiles who are uncircumcised. Both the Jew and the Gentile are purified of heart by faith. And so in Peter's uh, argument, if you will, his testimony, we, we hear some, some truths that are forever true. First of all, what God is doing, it's, it's his choice. Uh, in, in our world, we don't necessarily know what God is doing, but we, we have an idea. <laughs> we have an idea. Uh, but God's work among the Gentiles, that's his choice, it was not man's choice. And from God's perspective, from his, from his mind, the issue is not circumcision. The issue is the heart. It's the inward. It's not the outward. Remember when uh, the Lord had rejected Saul and had found a man after his own heart and he sent the prophet Samuel to the house of Jesse in Bethlehem to anoint him. Uh, Samuel saw the eldest and well, he was a tall, good-looking guy. Surely this is the one the Lord has in mind. And the Lord said, Samuel, no, 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 no. You look on the outward. I look on the inward. It's the heart that's the issue. And that's not, that's not, that's not a revelation, even to Samuel, because the Lord told the nation of Israel through Moses, in Deuteronomy chapter 10, to circumcise their hearts. It's always been that way. Uh, and then later in their history, uh, as during the, the ministry of Jeremiah, and Jeremiah minister, was ministering to a dying nation, and a lot of what you read in the book of Jeremiah is extraordinarily contemporary to our day and this nation. But anyway, in Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 4, God tells his people to circumcise their hearts. That's the problem. And later from Acts chapter 15, if we go to Romans chapter 2, this point is going to be amplified through the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 2. This issue of, of circumcision. Uh, starting in verse 23 of Romans chapter 2. Thou that makest thy boast of the law, through breaking the law, dishonorest thou God? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you, as it is written. For circumcision verily profiteth, if thou keep the law. But if thou be a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. Therefore, if the uncircumcision, the Gentiles, keep the righteousness of the law, which is love, and to believe, shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision? And shall not uncircumcision, which is by nature, if it fulfill the law, judge thee, who by the letter and circumcision does transgress the law? For he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh." But he is a Jew, which is one inwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. Uh, the issue in the first church council is not circumcision. It's the heart of man. And 
man's heart needs to be purified. And by faith, God has purified hearts in the Jews and in the Gentiles. It's, it, it's his work. It comes by faith, not by works. And so what God is doing and what has to come, they, they have to come to grips with this in this first, this first church council is that it's not Jew versus Gentile. It's Jew and Gentile. It's whosoever will believe. It comes by faith. The purifying of the heart comes by faith in who God is and what he has done. So back to Acts 15, verse 10. It says, Now therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. Paul's argument is a, a concise testimony of what God had already done, which they already knew because he told them that, but he's telling them again because he's bringing it into their remembrance. And therefore, this verses 10 and 11, his conclusion, again, just like it was the first time, is irrefutable. He says, why tempt ye God? Why? You know, we've been around this mountain before. Why are we going around it again? Why would we test? Why would we question? Why would we inspect God about what we already know he's done? Why would we burden these Gentile believers with something that we Jews have never been able to bear? But... We believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved. It's by the grace of God that a person is saved from condemnation and eternal death. It is not their performance. Uh, and so it's whosoever will believe. Uh, a Jew who believes, saved. A Gentile who believed, saved. A believing Jew and a believing Gentile are on the very same footing before God, and that footing is in Christ. The, the, the Pharisees, the sect of the Pharisees which believed, and the Pharisees that went up to Antioch uh, believed that the, if you essentially the, the law is a flotation device tossed to drowning man by God, but that's not the case. Jesus is the flotation of, uh, device whereby man must be saved. Verse 12. Then all the multitude gave silence. And gave audience to Barnabas and Paul, declaring what miracles and wonders God had wrought among the Gentiles by them. Peter gives his testimony. He gives his conclusion. The council has no rebuttal. And so the floor is given over to Paul and Barnabas, who once again give testimony to what God has done among the Gentiles by them through them. And I would hope <laughs> that the gen, excuse me, the, the Pharisees that are present would pay close attention. Why? Well, because Paul's one of them. He is a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee, and he was more zealous than they before being converted to serve the living God. This is, his is a voice they should listen to. Verse 13. And after they had held their peace, James answered saying, men, brethren, Hearken unto me. Simeon hath declared how God at first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And to this agree the words of the prophets, as it is written, After this I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down, and will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up, that the residue of men might seek after the Lord and all the Gentiles. Upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth all these things. End quote. Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. So, Peter testified, uh, Paul and Barnabas testified, and now James, the pastor of the church, confirms their testimonies using the word of God as his authority. Again, James. Who is this James? He, Yes, he's the pastor of the church in Jerusalem. He is the son of Mary and Joseph. 
He's the half-brother of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he was the one that was inspired to write that letter that we call the Epistle of James that was sent out to the entire church uh, during difficult times. He concludes. He summarizes all the discussions about the nature of the gospel. And basically he says, you know, God spoke to and through Peter to the Gentiles. And he saved those who believed. And that's that's not contrary to scripture because God spoke to and through the prophets to us, the Jews, about the Gentiles, just like he spoke to and through Peter to them. And in verses 16 and 17, he's quoting Amos 9, verse 11 and 12. Uh, the, the, the central point of which there in verse 16 is that he will build again the tabernacle of David. Uh, what is that? What's the tabernacle of David? It's, it's the risen Lord Jesus Christ. Remember at the beginning of his ministry in John chapter 2, he went into Jerusalem, he went to the temple, and he cleansed it of all the money changers. And what authority do you have to do this? And Jesus said, destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up again. And he was speaking of his body, which at that time they didn't understand. Uh, Later in his ministry, again, in Jerusalem, he said, when the Son of Man be lifted up, he will draw all men to himself. God, who will build again the tabernacle of David, prophesying through Amos to the Jews of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And here... In the first church council in Acts chapter 15, the testimonies of Peter and Paul and Barnabas are not contrary to the word of God. They bear witness that God is fulfilling his word. And so in one accord are the word of God, the spirit of God, and the servants of God. Therefore, essentially what I think James is saying, you know, this dispute that we're having amongst ourselves, it's of us. It's of the flesh. It's not of God. It's not of the spirit because the salvation of God, according to the scripture, according to the testimonies of what he's doing, uh, the salvation of God is for Jews and Gentiles. And it's by his grace. It's not by man's work, be it circumcision or keeping the law or whatever. And in verse 18, by saying, known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world, James is saying that God determined to do this from before the foundation of the world. You know, this, the saving of the Gentiles was not, it's not a divine impulse. (laughs) He knew from before the foundation of the world that this is what he was going to do. And in his foreknowledge, he told us in advance what he was going to do. And now in his timing and in his way, he's doing it. Verse 19. Wherefore, my sentence is, that we trouble not them which from among the Gentiles are turned to God, but that we write unto them that they abstain from pollution of idols and from fornication and from things strangled and from blood. For Moses of old time hath in every city them that preach him being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. So James is saying, with the word of God and the spirit of God as his authorities, he renders a decision. And he says, we are not going to trouble. We are not going to burden the Gentiles that God has saved. They do not need to be circumcised. Salvation is a matter of the heart. It's an inward issue, not an outward issue. And we're not going to put the yoke of the law on them. Because Jesus, when he taught on the Sermon on the Mount, he said, you know, I did not come to destroy the law and the prophets, but to fulfill them. And as will be uh, later recorded uh, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in Romans chapter 10, verse 4, that Jesus is the end, the completion, the fulfillment. He is the end of the law for righteousness for those who believe. We are saved by grace through faith, and that not of ourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man boast. We're his workmanship. And so we're not going to trouble them. And verse 21, we're going to write to them. We're going to guide, we're going to give them guidance. We're going to write to the Gentiles that believe to abstain from some things 
First of all, we're going to say that it's in their spiritual health to abstain from uh, idolatry. Well, that's always been true, still true. The very last word in John's first epistle, and the, the first epistle of John is all about love, all about knowing. And the last word in that uh, epistle is little children flee from idols. Uh, and so that guidance is given here in Acts chapter 15. Uh, we also read in verse 20 that they're going to give them written guidance to avoid fornication, sexual sin, which speaks of a spiritual sin as well, uh, to be revealed shortly in 1 Thessalonians. If we go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. If you read starting verse 1 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as ye have received of us how ye ought to walk and to please God, so ye would abound more and more. For ye know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor, not in lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God. And why is that? Because our body is the vessel, is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Do not defile God's temple with fornication. That counsel is going to be, and that guidance is going to be written. Uh, back in Acts chapter 15, also to abstain from things strangled, meaning uh, a, a dead animal that hasn't bled out, uh, or from blood, because life is in the blood. Uh, you're not to eat the blood, uh, according to the law. And it says as in verse 21, you know, Moses has preached every Sabbath day. Uh, they're going to learn, they will learn, the boundaries established by God within which we are safe and we live healthy lives that honor him. So that is James' decision. Is he, is James setting aside the law? No, 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 no. He's reinforcing the very purpose of the law. Let's go to Romans chapter 7. What is the law all about? Romans chapter 7, starting in verse 12. Wherefore, the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. But sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me, by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful, for we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. Uh, the law was given to reveal our sin. Uh, it's a mirror. When we read the law of God as a mirror, we see we fall short. We are not holy. We are unholy. We need help. So the law was given that we'd have the reflection in the mirror that would lead us to the foot of the cross. And the law is also our schoolmaster. You know, we have been in Galatians. And I'll just read this one to you. In Galatians chapter 3, verses 24 through 26. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster, for we are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. God gave the law to reveal our wickedness and to lead us to Jesus Christ. In Romans chapter 14, what is the purpose Romans 14, starting verse 17. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. 
For he that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. Let us therefore follow after the things which are which make for peace and things whereby one may edify another. For meat destroyeth not the work of God. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for that man who eateth with offense. It is good neither to eat flesh, nor to drink wine, nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth, or is offended, or is made weak. Hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in the thing which he alloweth. And he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. We stand before God by grace through faith. And the kingdom of God is about peace and edification and loving our neighbor as ourselves and loving him, the Lord our God, with first and foremost with every fiber of our being. In Acts chapter 15, by these things that will be written, James is guiding the Gentile believers into that which is good for peace and good for edification and good for love. Verse 22. Then pleased it the apostles and elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, surnamed Barsabbas, and Silas, chief men among the brethren. And they wrote letters by them after this manner. The apostles and elders and brethren send greeting unto the brethren which are of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia. Uh, the apostles, the other apostles, the elders of the church. In fact, the entire church, which includes the believing Pharisees, uh, agreed with James' conclusion and his decision. And they Say, okay, we're going to guide the Gentile believers this way. We're going to select qualified, credible, spiritually mature men. These two men, Judas Barsabbas and Silas, uh, to take our written letter back with Paul and Barnabas. And then also, as we'll read, to give them an oral report. And they call them brethren. Notice that they call them brethren. They're part of the family. They're brothers in Christ. Verse 24 for as much as we have heard that certain which went out from us have troubled you with words, subverting your souls, saying, ye must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment, it seemeth good to us, being assembled with one accord, to send chosen men unto you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men that have hazarded their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have sent therefore Judas and Silas, who shall also tell you the same things by mouth? Uh, the essential, essentially the content uh, of this letter from the church in Jerusalem to the church in Antioch and the other churches uh, among the Gentiles is that it, it's been brought to our attention that men that came from this church, men Paul describes in Galatians chapter 2, verse 4 as false brethren, uh, the men have come from this church with a teaching that has upset you telling you that you must be circumcised and you must keep the law of Moses in order to be saved. We did not send them. They didn't come by our authority. Uh, and their doctrine is the doctrine of demons. It's not the doctrine of God. Uh, therefore, to set the record straight, to comfort your souls, we who are in one accord are sending you this letter by chosen ambassadors. Verse 28. For it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things, that ye abstain from meats offered to idols and from blood and from things strangled and from fornication, from which if ye keep yourselves, ye shall do well. Fare ye well. So this internal dispute, this family squabble, this uproar, uh, regarding the gospel of Christ is resolved by whom? The Holy Ghost. Verse 28, it seemed good to the Holy Ghost. 
Jesus said, I will send you a comforter. And one of the things he's going to do is he's going to guide you into all truth. The Holy Spirit, faithful to his ministry, has guided the church into the truth about the gospel. For it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us, meaning the church is in one accord with the Holy Spirit. And so this is the direction, this is the guidance of the Holy Spirit uh, and the church. Uh, These things, these four things, if you abstain from them, uh, and, and you should want to because God has revealed them in his word to be unhealthy to mankind, both spiritually and physically. You would do well to stay away from those. Uh, stay away from these because if you don't, you'll destroy the peace between Jewish and Gentile believers. The church is Jewish and Gentile. Uh, the peace is absolutely essential. Uh, do these things and you'll keep the peace. Uh, but then you have to also go outward. And if you do these things, then you, if you don't do these things rather, then you will make your witness of Jesus Christ. Let me rephrase that. Let me think about that. Uh, it, to, abs- yeah, to abstain from these things, the church would make their witness not confusing. And it would make it not offensive. If they did not abstain from these things, then the witness of the church, the Gentile churches, would be confusing to unbelieving Gentiles and would be offensive to unbelieving Jews. Well, the message is to Jews and Gentiles. Uh, Therefore, the message cannot be confusing and it cannot be offensive. And that bottom line is why those things are. Uh, He they conclude very well, which means goodbye, but also means have health and strength. To have health and to have strength, that's the motive of those necessary things that were written in verse 29. So, who led the church council? This first church council, so vitally important. Who led it? Well, the Holy Spirit did. Because we see oneness of heart and mind with God and man in one accord. We see a harmony of the testimony of scriptures with the testimony of God's co-laborers among the Gentiles. And we see peace in the church, peace between Jewish believers and Gentile believers. And all of that brings glory to Jesus Christ. And the body of Christ is spiritually healthy. And so it ends really, really well. So that means... This dispute about how a person can be saved is settled, right? You know, standing on the authority of the word of God, guided into the truth by the spirit of God, the church being in one accord with the Holy Spirit, uh, they've settled for all time the gospel of grace, right? No, they haven't. Because the gospel of grace is always under attack. Moving forward from here, we're going to see a group of people known as the Judaizers. Uh, they're false brethren. They're wolves in sheep's clothing. Uh, they're probably Pharisees that don't believe, or maybe, as Paul would say, they're false brethren. But what they do, what they're going to be doing, is they're going to follow Paul everywhere he goes to preach the gospel of Christ, the gospel of grace. And when he leaves town, they're going to evangelize the believers with their gospel, which is... You must be circumcised. You must keep the law of Moses. It's the salvation by works, which stands opposed to salvation by grace. So it's not over. It's still not over. You know, in our time, the gospel of grace is still attacked, even by believers in Jesus Christ. We still have people, even entire denominations, that you would say are modern day Judaizers attacking the gospel of grace. A gospel of Jesus plus, you know, your work plus his work or the gospel of salvation by works, that's, it's still in Christianity. It hasn't gone away. And so we step back and we, we take a look at where we are here in 2021. Uh, in the world, 
there's confusion and corruption and darkness and deception. In this nation, the very same things. And in Christianity, the very same things. So if we look to the world or we look to the government of this nation or if we look to the doctrines of men in Christianity uh, for answers as how it is we should now live, how it is that we are saved, we're going to be confused and distracted and discouraged. But if we look into the word of God and receive our teaching and guidance from the Holy Spirit, we will be settled, we will be focused, and we'll be encouraged. And what the word of God says, what the testimony of the Holy Spirit is, in Christ, the believer has a loving relationship with the Father in heaven, not a legal one. In Christ, we have fellowship with God based on his faithfulness, his performance, his merit, his righteousness, his work. None of that is ours. It's all his. And so the gospel of grace, that is the gospel of grace. That's the message of the church to a dark and dying world, this present evil world. That's the message of the church to the world today. That is how. A person can be saved from condemnation and eternal death. So, how can a person be saved? Is it the gospel of grace, which comes from God and sets us free? Or is it the gospel of works, which is of the devil and is nothing more than bondage? Well, we have a blessed hope, do we not? If you go with me to Titus, remember uh, Titus, one of the guys that went with Paul and Barnabas to Jerusalem from Antioch was this guy named Titus to whom Paul will write a letter inspired words of God in Titus chapter 2 starting in verse 11 for the grace of God that bringeth salvation the grace of God brings salvation not the works of men for the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared to all men the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us he went to the cross he suffered died he buried he walked out of the tomb three days later he has defeated our enemy teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust we should live soberly righteously and godly in this present world Looking, how do we live in this present world? Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, a purchased people, purchased with his blood, zealous of good works, zealous of being Christ-like, thinking like talking like, acting as Jesus would in this present evil world. We have a blessed hope. Jesus left, but before he left, he said he's coming back. And he's, he's going to. We know uh, that, yes, these are tumultuous times, times of great upheaval, uh, perhaps walking into times of suffering even. But... We know that the suffering of this present time cannot be compared to the glory that will be revealed in us, and that is Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. So, with a firm, unshakable, uncompromising gospel, the gospel of grace, with proper orientation and having things brought into our remembrance, we can be encouraged to march into next week, <laughs> even after this week. And we have that for every week that we're given. Uh, amen? So, be encouraged, look up, be faithful, share the good news of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the time this morning that you've given to us to consider things that will never change. Your word, the absolute truth, that came from eternity into time and is true for all time. And it is true for the times in which we live. And we need the guidance of your spirit. We need the truth of your word 
in these days. Please anoint us with your spirit. Please give us a hunger for your word. And Holy Spirit, please teach us and empower us to walk in Christ before God and before men. And to him be all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.